Chapter 8 of Headlong Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 The Tower. In all the thoughts, words, and actions of Squire Headlong, there was a remarkable alacrity of progression, which almost annihilated the interval between conception and execution. He was utterly regardless of obstacles, and seemed to have expunged their very name from his vocabulary. His designs were never nipped in their infancy by the contemplation of those trivial difficulties which often turn awry the current of enterprise, and, though the rapidity of his movements was sometimes arrested by a more formidable barrier, either naturally existing in the pursuit he had undertaken, or created by his own impetuosity, he seldom failed to succeed either in knocking it down or cutting his way through it. He had little idea of gradation. He saw no interval between the first step and the last, but pounced upon his object with the impetus of a mountain cataract. This rapidity of movement, indeed, subjected him to some disasters which cooler spirits would have escaped. He was an excellent sportsman, and almost always killed his game, but now and then he killed his dog. Rocks, streams, hedges, gates, and ditches were objects of no account in his estimation, though a dislocated shoulder several severe bruises and two or three narrow escapes for his neck might have been expected to teach him a certain degree of caution in effecting his transitions he was so singularly alert in climbing precipices and traversing torrents that when he went out on a shooting party he was very soon left to continue his sport alone for he was sure to dash up or down some nearly perpendicular path where no one else had either ability or inclination to follow he had a pleasure boat on the lake which he steered with amazing dexterity but he always indulged himself in the utmost possible latitude of sail he was occasionally upset by a sudden gust and was indebted to his skill in the art of swimming for the opportunity of tempering with a copious libation of wine the unnatural frigidity introduced into his stomach by the extraordinary intrusion of water an element which he had religiously determined should never pass his lips but of which on these occasions he was sometimes compelled to swallow no inconsiderable quantity. This circumstance alone, of the various disasters which befell him, occasioned him any permanent affliction, and he accordingly noted the day in his pocket-book as a dies nefastus, with this simple abstract and brief chronicle of the calamity. Mem. Swallowed two or three pints of water. Without any notice whatever of the concomitant circumstances. These days, of which there were several, were set apart in Headlong Hall for the purpose of anniversary expiation. And, as often as the day returned, on which the squire had swallowed water, he made not only a point of swallowing a treble allowance of wine himself, but imposed a heavy mulct on every one of his servants who should be detected in a state of sobriety after sunset. But their conduct on these occasions was so uniformly exemplary that no instance of the affliction of the penalty appears on record. The squire and Mr. Milestone, as we have already said, had set out immediately after breakfast to examine the capabilities of the scenery. The object that most attracted Mr. Milestone's admiration was a ruined tower on a projecting point of rock, almost totally overgrown with ivy. This ivy, Mr. Milestone observed, required trimming and clearing in various parts. A little pointing and polishing was also necessary for the dilapidated walls, and the whole effect would be materially increased by a plantation of spruce fir interspersed with cypress and juniper the present rugged and broken ascent from the land side being first converted into a beautiful slope which might be easily effected by blowing up a part of the rock with gunpowder laying on a quantity of fine mould and covering the whole with an elegant stratum of turf squire headlong caught with avidity at this suggestion and as he had always a store of gunpowder in the house for the accommodation of himself and his shooting visitors and for the supply of a small battery of cannon, which he kept for his private amusement, he insisted on commencing operations immediately. Accordingly, he bounded back to the house and very speedily returned, accompanied by the little butler and a half-dozen servants and labourers with pickaxes and gunpowder, a hanging stove and a poker, together with a basket of cold meat and two or three bottles of Madeira. For the squire thought, with many others, that a copious supply of provision is a very necessary ingredient in all rural amusements. Mr. Milestone superintended the proceedings. The rock was excavated, the powder introduced, 
the apertures strongly blockaded with fragments of stone a long train was laid to a spot which mr milestone fixed on as sufficiently remote from the possibility of harm the squire seized the poker and after flourishing it in the air with a degree of dexterity which induced the rest of the party to leave him in solitary possession of an extensive circumference applied the end of it to the train and the rapidly communicated ignition ran hissing along the surface of the soil at this critical moment mr cranium and mr panscope appeared at the top of the tower which unseeing and unseen they had ascended on the opposite side to that where the squire and mr milestone were conducting their operations their sudden appearance a little dismayed the squire who however comforted himself with the reflection that the tower was perfectly safe or at least was intended to be so and that his friends were in no probable danger but of a knock on the head from a flying fragment of stone the succession of these thoughts in the mind of the squire was commensurate in rapidity to the progress of the ignition which having reached its extremity the explosion took place and the shattered rock was hurled into the air in the midst of fire and smoke mr milestone had properly calculated the force of the explosion for the tower remained untouched but the squire in his consolatory reflections had omitted the consideration of the influence of sudden fear which had so violent an effect on mr cranium who was just commencing a speech concerning the very fine prospect from the top of the tower that cutting short the thread of his observations he bounded under the elastic influence of terror several feet into the air his ascent being unluckily a little out of the perpendicular he descended with a proportionate curve from the apex of his projection and alighted not on the wall of the tower but in an ivy bush by its side which giving way beneath him transferred him to a tuft of hazel at its base which after upholding him an instant consigned him to the boughs of an ash that had rooted itself in a fissure about half way down the rock which finally transmitted him to the waters below squire headlong anxiously watched the tower as the smoke which at first enveloped it rolled away but when the shadowy curtain was withdrawn and mr panscope was discovered solace in a tragical attitude his apprehension became boundless and he concluded that the unlucky collision of a flying fragment of rock had indeed emancipated the spirit of the craniologist from its terrestrial bondage mr Escott had considerably outstripped his companions and arrived at the scene of the disaster just as mr cranium being utterly destitute of natatorial skill was in imminent danger of final submersion the deteriorationist who had cultivated this valuable art with great success immediately plunged into his assistance and brought him alive and in safety to a shelving part of the shore their landing was hailed with a view holler from the delighted squire who shaking them both heartily by the hand and making ten thousand lame apologies to mr cranium concluded by asking in a pathetic tone how much water had he swallowed and without waiting for his answer filled a large tumbler with madeira and insisted on his tossing it off which was no sooner said than done mr jenkinson and mr foster now made their appearance mr panscope descended the tower which he vowed never again to approach within a quarter of a mile the tumbler of madeira was replenished and handed round to recruit the spirits of the party which now began to move towards headlong hall the squire capering for joy in the van and the fat little butler waddling in the rear the squire took care that mr cranium should be seated next to him at dinner and piled him so hard with madeira to prevent him as he said from taking cold that long before the ladies sent in their summons to coffee every organ in his brain was in a complete state of revolution and the squire was under the necessity of ringing for three or four servants to carry him to bed observing with a smile of great satisfaction that he was in a very excellent way for escaping any ill consequence that might have resulted from his accident the beautiful cephalus being thus freed from his surveillance was enabled during the course of the evening to develop to his preserver the full extent of her gratitude. End of chapter 8